All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. So check it out, you guys. I'm going to get into another story about death row. However, let me make it very clear that this is not a continuation or a part three on the death row story that was just recently put out. The story about the hypocrisy of death row politics. I will be coming out with a part three for that story sometime soon, but this is not it. This story right here is about a war that was kicked off on death row between the Mexican mafia and the, the prison administration, basically the COs that worked in the adjustment center. That ended up escalating to where the Bloods and the Crips got involved and then it segued into some other incidents that I'll get into. However, in order for you guys to really understand this story and some of the things that, you know, some of the, the things that I'm going to be talking about in this story, I need to talk a little bit about how the Adjustment Center was at the time, it, you know, when I used to go through there back in the early 90s. It's changed drastically from what it is now. Trust me. And it changed as a result of these wars that I'm going to talk about. But let me just say this, you know, as as an ad sec inmate, the Adjustment Center was the place to be. There was only two places for me to go back in the early 90s because I was validated when Whenever I would drive up to San Quentin, straight off the bus, I would go to either East Block or the Adjustment Center. 98% of the guys that were validated that were at SEG inmates would go to East Block. The other 2%, you'd only get sent to the Adjustment Center if you had, you know, a long history of staff assaults or if you were somebody that they felt like you had a little bit too much influence over your people. You were calling shots or you just had influence they would send you to the adjustment center. But again, for somebody like me that was an ad seg inmate, the adjustment center at that time was the place to be because whenever I would hit a tier over there and get around guys like Hector, Ronnie, Chato, Smokey, you know, Mex whether it was Mexican Mafia, Crips, Bloods, I met them all when I was over there. Little Fee, Roscoe, I, I told you guys in several stories that I've put out before that Tookie was a close friend. I met all these dudes, Evil, Tretch, the list goes on and on. But, you know, at that time when I was going through there in the early 90s, whenever I would hit a tear, they would shoot me a radio, headphones, canteen, sweats, sw you know, everything that I needed. I would get hooked up. I was spoiled going over there. So I never wanted to go to East Block. I always wanted to go back to the Adjustment Center. Plus, there were some big ass cells. The setup was a lot different. All that changed because of these wars right here that I'm going to talk about. It all changed. They went in and retrofitted all the cells to where there's solid walls in front of the cells. Now, there's solid doors. When you go to the Adjustment Center now, and they lock you in one of those cells, it's like you're being entombed. The best way I can describe it is like when you go into a, a cell and they close the door behind you, it's like them closing a hatch in a submarine. I'm, I'm telling you, you're like entombed. You can't hear your neighbors. Back when I was going through there in the early 90s, everything was free flowing. There was bars and then there was mesh over the bars. So you could literally hear your neighbor whispering. But you can't you can't hear nothing like that over there now. Everything's solid doors. You guys should be looking at pictures of, you know, if I could find pictures of how it was back in the early 90s, I'll put them up. But at least you'd be looking at pictures now of the solid white walls and the doors that they put in front of all the cells. Anyways, so this story right here, it started, it actually started in 1998 while I was there on a tier with two of the main individuals that ended up kicking everything off. So in the summer of 1998, while being housed in the Adjustment Center, there was an East Coast Crip by the name of DMAC. Well, he actually went by Malik, but I guess later on he changed his name to DMAC. But DMAC got into a verbal argument with an individual by the name of Carlos Savina. Now, Carlos is from LA and he was known to be a strong sympathizer or a supporter of the Mexican Mafia. I was actually in a cell between Carlos and DMAC. I'm going to have to get used to that name, DMAC, because I'm telling you, he was going by Malik. Anyway, so, you know, being housed on the tier with these guys, 
because DMAC was a crib and Carlos was running with the Mexican mafia, you know, their interaction was limited, but they coexisted back there like everybody else did. If Carlos had literature that DMAC wanted to borrow, he would send it to him. You know, there was a level of respect just living on the tier, you know, that they respected. Everybody did. That's what convicts do. There wasn't, you know, a lot of tension or they didn't talk because they're supposed to be enemies or these were grown ass men. And these guys were fighting for their lives. So they weren't really tripping off those kind of politics. But, you know, in the course of just living on the tier, every now and then somebody would get into some type of petty little squabble, whether it was because somebody had the radio up too high or somebody was working out and they were banging you know, too loud on the floor or something like that. You know, conflicts like that, they 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 happen. Now, when I met Carlos, he embraced me, you know, but Carlos was more like a paisa. He kind of had that accent and he just came across as being like a paisa. But being on the tier with him, seeing how he interacted with Hector Ayala, a known Mexican mafia member, and how he interacted with the other Sureños on the tier, it became apparent to me that Carlos was involved in their politics. He was on their gallo, you know, they would wake up every morning and say buenos dias to him. And, you know, he was involved in their politics. He was out there on the yard with them. And I would even go as far as saying that, you know, Carlos was like, he was like a sureño. And I know for a fact that he took direction from the Mexican mafia because there were some other things that were going on, you know, between the Adjustment Center and East Block. I'm not going to get into all those details, but just trust me, Carlos was you know, a strong sympathizer for the Mexican mafia. You know, as far as DMAC, obviously him living on the other side of me, him being an Africano and, you know, because I was a Norteño, I would interact with him a lot more. You know, we used to kick it on the tier. Besides that, he was on the yard with Fee at that time. So when we would go out, the NF yard would go out with the BGF yard, Fee, Roscoe, DMAC and Little Money. I remember Little Money was out there and some other cribs were out there on the yard. So I used to kick it with them out there on the yard, you know, through the fence. We would we would conversate. So I got to know, I almost called him Malik again. I got to know DMAC, you know, pretty good during the time that I was there. I want to say, you know, the first time I, I went through there, I spent like six, seven months with, with these guys on that tier. I ended up landing on another tier with Carlos again a second time when I went back. Then I ran into DMAC again later on. So I knew both of these guys fairly well. I was even there when Malik drove up to death row from the county jail, from LA County Jail. And you know, everybody that gets sent to death row, they have to go through the adjustment center. It's, it's protocol. They go through the adjustment center. They stay there for like 90 days. And during these 90 days, this is when they figure out what yard they're going to put them on over there in East Block, if they're even going to allow them to go to East Block and all that good stuff. They want to see, if, you know, how they program over there first. So anyways, I got to know, you know, DMAC fairly well being on the tier with them. And the one thing that stood out about DMAC is that he was the type of crib who wasn't just a, another follower. He was the type of crib that wanted to come into death row and push a hard line. In fact, I remember two incidents that stood out about him. One was the fact that he got into a verbal disagreement with Chopo from Watsonville, who was the Norteño that was on the same yard as me. Matter of fact, you guys have heard me talk about Chopo several times in the past. And this was during the time when me and Mike Eagle from Salinas were actually, we were recruiting Chopo. We were pulling him as, as a C. But anyways, I remember DMAC having a, he got into some kind of personal disagreement with Chopo because Chopo was on that same tier. And, you know, I don't remember what it was that they were going back and forth about. But the thing that I, I, I do remember is that DMAC did not like Chopo. For whatever reason, he didn't like him. I got the impression that he did not like Chopo because he was an Africano that was running with the North Daniels. Straight up. That's just... That's just, I could be wrong, but that's the impression I got. Again, I don't know the context of the disagreement. I don't remember, but I just remember that DMAC, he wasn't feeling Chopo at all. So the other thing I remember about DMAC is that he was trying to start and lead a movement that he was calling the B's and C's. 
the bloods and the crips. You know, the bloods and the crips are already united on death row. They put the street politics aside and they run together on death row. But DMACC was trying to take it to another level and he was trying to push this movement for ulterior motives. I remember talking to him about it, you know, being on the tier with him. And, you know, he had told me, he was like, hey, man, I'm trying to start, you know, some some something new, you know, with, with some of my comrades on death row. And we're calling it the B's and the C's. I remember him touching on it briefly, but it was basically the Bloods and the Crips. You know, again, like I said, they were already united, but he was trying to take it to another level on some radical type of bullshit he was on. But it's something that I always remembered about DMAC. But anyways, like I told you guys, at one point, you know, while I was there in between DMAC and Carlos on the tier, you know, and we interacted with each other. I don't remember those two ever getting into a disagreement or, you know, a time where they got into an argument and it turned heated or anything like that. So if these two got into some type of disagreement, it happened later after I left. So obviously something kicks off on the tier. Somebody got disrespected. They exchanged words. I'm not sure how far it went. I don't know if it, you know, got as bad as name calling or anything like that, or if they threatened each other, but something happened. Something happened on the tier and these two went at it. So according to my source, DMAC gets released from the adjustment center. And this happens sometime after this, this whatever kind of argument they got into. He gets shipped back to East Block. And apparently he went to his annual classification review and they decided that it was time to let him go to East Block. He goes to committee and they kick him loose. They kick him over to East Block. So, you know, again, by this time I'm gone. And remember, I told you guys that East Block is considered the equivalent of Death Row's mainline. So, you know, DMAC, I'm sure he was happy to get cut loose to get sent over to East Block. They put him on a tier over there somewhere in East Block and he gets assigned to Yard 2. Yard 2 at that time was active Sureños, active Crips, and active Bloods. You had one Mexican Mafia member that was out there at that time, Davi from Fontana. But I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So, you know, DMAC gets over there, he gets on the tier, and he's assigned to Yard 2. And that's where he, he'd been programming. So again, Yard 2 is considered to be an active yard. Everyone that was out there were coexisting under a collective agreement in accordance to death row politics. Whatever, whatever kind of politics they implemented on that yard, everybody that was out there was respecting them. The Crips, the Bloods, the Sureños, whatever those politics were, whatever those policies were, everybody was on the same page. I don't know what they were, but they were out there programming. You know, and that's the thing about it. When you're coexisting on a yard like this where everybody's functioning together and you're all on the same page, there's rules of engagement when problems do arise. If you got a personal disagreement with somebody, you got an issue with somebody that's out there on the yard, especially somebody from a different group segment, there's protocols that you have to, there's a process that you have to go by or a process you have to follow. You can't just go out there and take off on somebody because you don't like them or because you had issues with them on the street or issues with them in the adjustment center. You got to go out there and depending on who you are and what's going on, there's certain people that you probably have to talk to to either resolve it or to go ahead and get clearance to go ahead and deal with it. But there's protocol nonetheless. So anyways, about a month after DMAC gets moved to East Block, Carlos, apparently he goes to committee. He goes to committee and he had given them some clean time. He hadn't gotten any trouble over there. So classification is like, you know what? You've been stuck over here for a while. We're going to let you go to East Block. I don't know how long Carlos had been stuck in East Block at that time, but I know it was for a while. And, you know, Carlos... To him, to somebody like Carlos that had been stuck in the adjustment center for all those years and to find out that you're going to East Block, I'm sure he was just happy to be leaving. He, he wasn't thinking about no conflict. He wasn't thinking about going over there and checking anybody or, or you know, getting over there and, and making an issue with, with DMAC, out, making an issue out of their, their disagreement or anything like that. I'm sure Carlos was just happy that he was going to go to East Block finally after all these years. He was going to be given all these privileges back, be able to use the phone, go out to, you know, contact visits with his family and all that good stuff. Drugs on the tier, 
access it, all kind of stuff that you just don't get in the adjustment center. Honestly, Carlos probably got over there and he probably forgot that he even got into a, a disagreement with DMAC. From my personal perspective of being on the tier with Carlos, he's like, he's an older guy, but, you know, he's one of those older guys that's set in his ways. And, you know, it, it, the older he gets, the grumpier he gets. So he probably forgot all about that argument he had with DMAC. He probably had arguments with, you know, several other cats over there in the adjustment center. That's how he was. He was just a grouchy dude, you know, just talking to him. He had a tendency to sometimes snap back, but he meant nothing by it. That's that's just Carlos. So during Carlos's first day out to the yard, you know, he gets out there and David from Fontana's out there, the only Mexican mafia member that's on that yard at that time. And then there was like 20 other Sureños that were out there. So, you know, everybody that seen Carlos coming out to the yard, they all know that Carlos was stuck in the adjustment center for a long time. You know, they were probably like, man, the homie, he finally, they finally cut him loose. So Carlos gets out there, he's making his rounds, he's shaking everybody's hands. And he's just, I'm sure he was just happy to be on a yard, to be around, you know, his people again, to be given, you know, the freedoms that he was given that come with being in East Block. But the thing about it is that Carlos, he doesn't give any of the Sureños or, the you know, David a heads up, or he doesn't tell him anything about the disagreement that he had with DMAC. Me, honestly, I honestly believe that Carlos probably either forgot or he just wasn't tripping. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to come over here and start tripping off that old bullshit, end up getting into it with this cat, get rolled up and go back to the adjustment center. So maybe he just wasn't tripping on it. But either way, he goes over there. He doesn't tell David nothing. He doesn't tell any of the other Sureños anything about the disagreement he had. And in a situation like this, it's absolutely necessary to give your people a heads up so that everybody can kind of be, you know, on point, if anything, just in case anything kicks off. And because he doesn't mention nothing about it, nobody's got their head on a swivel. Nobody's expecting anything to happen. They're just out there programming like they did every other day. So again, at the time that this incident kicked off, David from Fontana was the only Mexican mafia member that was out there. Then you had about 20 other Sureños that were on the yard, but you also had about 20 Bloods that were out there. And then you had another 40 Crips that were out there. And keep in mind, the Bloods and the Crips were united on that yard. They stood together, right or wrong, good or bad, win, lose, or draw. They had each other's backs out there. Some of the Bloods who I personally knew that were out there on the yard at that time were Little Ace, Big Time, Bo Peep, Ant Dog, Mario, and a few others. Then you had about 40 Crips. You had the Long Beach Crips, the East Coast Crips, and the Rolling 60s Crips. Little Fee from the Rolling 60s Crips, he was even out there. Somebody that I spent a lot of time in the Adjustment Center with as well. And, you know, they're carrying on with their normal everyday routine. You got guys out there playing basketball. Others are out there doing bar work. People are playing chess. There's like 80 cats out there. And these yards are not that big, but there's, you know, there's a lot of people out there and everybody's just kind of doing their own thing. So at one point, Carlos walks to an area where he hung his jacket up on one of the fences. He hung his jacket up on the fence and, you know, he walked over to his jacket to get something out of one of his pockets. And DMAC just so happened to be standing in that area. And keep in mind, I'm not going to say Carlos didn't see DMAC out there. But if you guys are looking at the pictures of these yards, they're they're not that big. And 80 dudes out there, you know, it gets shoulder to shoulder. So it's it's possible that Carlos didn't even see DMAC in the crowd. That's how many people were out there. But Carlos goes over to his jacket and he reaches in his pocket to grab something. And DMAC is standing a couple of feet away from him and he's he's watching him. And DMAC looks at this as a perfect opportunity to snake Carlos. And that's what he did. Carlos wasn't expecting it. He's reaching for his jacket, doing whatever he's doing. And DMAC punches him in the nose. When DMAC punches Carlos in the nose, he squares up with DMAC. Now, they, now they're now they going at it. These two start going at it. Bing, bop, bing, bop, bing, bop, bing, boop, bop, bing, bing, bop, bing, bop, up and shoot. Bop, 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 bop. You guys know how I do it. Huh. So... They're going at it, and David from Fontana, 
him not knowing that these two had any kind of disagreement. He don't know anything's going on between these two. All he sees is that they're going at it. So Davi, you know, being that he's the only Mexican mafia member over there, that's his people. He goes over there to defend Carlos. He goes in on DMAX. So all three of them are going at it now. So, so they're going at it. When the Sureños see Davi backing up Carlos, and this is a Mexican mafia member, there's no question about it. All 20 of them, they all start, they all rush over there and they all start, they all start fighting. So after the Bloods and the Crips jump in, now you got like 70 dudes out there that, that are that are getting it in and they're going at it. You see shoes flying out, socks, boxers, jackets, cups. These motherfuckers, they're going at it. They're trying to kill each other out there. So this lasts for about a good four or five minutes. And that's a long time for a melee to, to, to kick off on a yard like this. The gunners, they start busting those the, the 37 millimeter, you know, non-lethal rounds to break it up. But these guys, they're still going at it. It takes them about four or five minutes before everybody stops fighting and they get down. By this time, you got like 200 cops all, all the, the COs that respond from East Block and all the surrounding units, they're all standing in front of that yard, banging on the gate, telling these guys to stop. That's what they do. When a yard gets off like that, you know, they all post up in front of the yard and they'll have their sticks, their billy clubs, and they'll be tapping the gate. Hey, get your fucking ass down. Get down. So eventually everybody stops fighting. They all stop fighting. They all prone out. And then they go through the, the, the slow process of calling, you know, everybody off the yard one by one, cuffing them up and then escorting them into the unit and putting them into a cage. And then eventually getting them medically cleared and taking them back up to their cells. That takes a while. But anyways, this created a huge housing dilemma because they could only house so many people in, in the adjustment center. I want to say the adjustment center, it housed anywhere from two to 300 guys, you know, to full capacity. There are only one man cells over there and it's not that big of a building, but it, however many it is, you know, they can only bring so many of these guys over there. So they create a, a grade B, you know, condemned overflow tier for the guys that, you know, they don't have room to move to AC. And then they, they move most of the main instigators, the guys that have a lot of influence, obviously guys like Davi, and then you got, you know, Big Time, Little Ace. They know who, who has influence, but all the guys that had an influence for the Bloods, the ones that had influence for the Cribs, they all get moved to the Adjustment Center and the Sureños. Now, the only ones that didn't get involved out there when this kicked off was Fee and the Rolling 60s Cribs. Now, the reason why they didn't get involved is because D-Mac didn't give them a heads up when he took off on Carlos. And they were upset about that. And rightfully so, because you got, you know, that's one of the reasons why there's protocol for things like this. If you go out there on the yard and you have a disagreement with somebody and you don't give your people a heads up, you know, you're taking it a chance of several things could happen. Fee and, and, you know, the other Rolling 60s Crips, they could have their dope out. They could have their weapons out. And they're going to lose all that shit. Once they put the yard down, they're not going to have time to put all that shit, you know, they're not going to have time to put it all away to secure it. They're going to end up losing it. So not just things like that, but nobody wants to get caught up in a crossfire when something kicks off. You got bullets flying around and shit like that. So when everybody ended up getting moved to the adjustment center that was going to be moved over there, it probably took about a week for everybody to go to classification, get cleared to go to a group yard in the in the adjustment center. And you know, it was at this point when they all went to the to the group yards that everybody had a chance to talk about what had happened over there in East Block. Everything that led up to, you know, the, the melee and you know, you had Ronnie, Hector, Chato, Smokey, Mexican Mafia, and all the Sureños on one yard. Then you had 
the Crips, the Bloods, and everybody that was involved in that other incident on another group yard out there. So, you know, they come up to the fence and they talk about everything that led up to that melee. And, you know, it's obvious that it all started over D-Mac and Carlos. D-Mac was the one that kicked it off. He took off on Carlos. Then from that point on, David from Fontana, he jumped in. All 20 of the Sureños end up following Davi, and then everything else from that point, the Bloods and the Crips jump in, and, and there you have it. So, you know, they talk about everything that led up to that, and they basically agree that, you know what, we're just going to squash it. We're going to squash it. It's, you know, the best course of action for everybody is to squash it, and that's because it was a spur-of-the-moment thing that was kicked off by DMAC. DMAC, I don't know where he was. He wasn't part of the conversation out there on the yard, obviously. I don't know if they put him on walk alone. I don't know where he was housed at at that time. That wasn't clear to me. However, you know, they figured that since it was the spur of the moment thing that just kicked off and then everybody else followed suit, they were just going to let it go. Not only that, but there was no weapons that were used. Nobody pulled out any weapons. Nobody got stabbed. Nobody got cut. Nothing like that. So everybody agreed that, they were just going to let it go. It was a dead issue. However, the Mexican mafia, they stipulated that, you know, if DMAC ends up on a yard over there with any of their active Sureños or Mexican mafia members, that he had a green light on them. You know, I, well, I don't know if I should say that they were in agreement with it, but it was probably like, you know, Ronnie and Hector and them, they probably said, you know what, if we end up on a yard with that dude, he's got an issue coming. And they were probably like, hey, you know, handle your business. You know, I don't think it was a situation where they were like, hey, go ahead, you know, take off on that fool. He got an issue coming. It was probably more, you know, of, hey, if that's that's on him. He's the one that kicked that off. He knew what he was doing when he decided to take off on Carlos. And that's that's just an issue he's going to have to deal with. So that's what was agreed to at that time. So they agreed to squash it. Now, fast forward six months. So everybody that was involved, they've been in the Adjustment Center now for a good six months. And, you know, some of the bloods that were involved, they start going to committee again. Committee starts kicking them loose. They start sending them back to East Block. These are the bloods that were involved in this melee. So several of them go to go to classification and they, they kick them back to East Block. They house them back over there and they get assigned back to Yard 2. And now they're programming again. So classification, they're letting the Bloods go back to East Block. Now, when a lot of the Sureños go to committee for their review, classification, they start to dig their heels down, you know, and tell these guys, we're not ready to let you go back. We're going to retain you in the Adjustment Center for whatever, another three, four months. But, you know, it's not like they're any more guilty than the Bloods. They're all culpable and they're all responsible on the same level. They were all involved in the riot. But for whatever reason, classification, they're not letting the Sureños go back to East Block. They're only letting certain individuals go back who they feel they want to let go back. That's basically what it comes down to. So by their own actions, the administration, more specifically the institution's classification unit, they created more drama by selectively choosing who they allowed to go back to East Block and who they chose to keep in the Adjustment Center. They basically let all the Bloods and Crips go back that were involved but refused to let any of the Sureños go back. This was obvious. And the Mexican mafia, they interpreted this as an act of repression. They're like, you know what? There's no reason why they shouldn't let us go back to East Block. You know, we were they were involved just as much as we were involved. So why did they let them go back? But yet they're keeping us slammed down in the adjustment center. And like I told you guys, East Block is death row's main line. They take it very serious when, you know, they have to get slammed down in the adjustment center, when, you know, they take them away from East Block because that's where they get all their privileges. That's where they get to, you know, go out in the visiting room and have, you know, contact visits with their family, with their kids. That's when they get access at using the phone. There's all the things that I told you guys about in the previous story. They don't get that in the adjustment center. You're slammed down over there. You don't get no phone and all your visits are behind a plate glass window. So 
These guys are mad. They're upset. Why why aren't they giving us our East Block status back? That's some bullshit. But there's nothing that they can do about it in the beginning. They just they they roll with the punches. There's like, you know what? Fuck it. We'll give them three, four more months clean time, and eventually they'll let us go back. So that's what they do. So a few more months go by, and still nothing changes. Several of the Sureños that were involved in the conflict end up going to their classification reviews again, and they were still being denied their East Block status. But still, again, they stand down. They're like, you know what? We're not gonna, we're not gonna fuck ours off just yet. We're just gonna continue to program in in the adjustment center, and hopefully, by the time we go to our next review in another ninety days, they'll let us go back. But in the meantime, in between time, a lot of the Bloods and the Crips that went back to East Block, they're over there on Yard 2, and another melee kicks off between the Rolling 60s Crips and the Bloods. I'm not sure what it stemmed from, what it was about. They usually get along, but something happened over there where somebody got disrespected, something got out of hand, and they, they, they went at each other. So they get off again. All these guys that were involved in the first incident, they all end up getting moved back to the Adjustment Center. Plus, Fee and the Rolling 60s Crips, they all get moved to the Adjustment Center as well. So when, when this second melee kicks off and, you know, all these guys come back to the Adjustment Center, I'm sure Ronnie, Hector, Chato, Smokey, and all those guys, they're probably like, you know what? This is a good opportunity for us because this probably means that they're going to start letting a lot of the, you know, our people go back to East Block now. These guys, you know, they're going to probably get slammed down in the adjustment center for a while, but this is probably going to open up some doors for us. So this is actually a good thing, especially since a lot of the Sureños that were involved in that first incident had been in the adjustment center for, you know, a while now. By now, it's a lot of them have been there for over a year. It had been like 14 months at that point, 14, 15 months. So they're thinking like, man, the next time we go to, you know, the ICC, they're going to let us go. They're definitely going to going to send us back to East Block. So fast forward another six months now. It's been about two years since that first incident kicked off. To add insult to injury, a lot of the bloods that were involved in the second incident they're getting sent back to East Block a second time. And the Sureños that are going to classification, they're being told again that they're not letting them go to East Block, that they're going to retain them in the Adjustment Center for another 90 days, another six months, however long it was. But now it's obvious what's happening. They let all these bloods go back. And this is the second incident that they got involved in. Fee and a lot of the rolling 60s Crips now they're holding them in the adjustment center as well. They're not letting them go back to East Block. So you got Fee and the Rolling 60s Crips. You got a lot of the Sureños, the Mexican Mafia. They're all stranded in the adjustment center, and they're not letting them go back. But they let all the Bloods go back. And this is the second time that they got into a melee over there. So it was at the point where, you know, when they started trickling a lot of the Bloods back to East Block the second time, it was at that point that... Ronnie, Hector, Chato, Smokey, Davi, and whatever other Mexican mafia members that were housed in the adjustment center at that time. That's when, you know, they pretty much said, you know what? Fuck this. This is a form of oppression. They're keeping us slammed down over here. It's wrong what they're doing. We're being singled out. These guys, you know, they got involved in two incidents and they're letting them go back. There's no justified reasoning for this. So, that's when they declared war against the administration, mainly the COs that worked in the Adjustment Center. It was at that point where they said, you know what, enough is enough. We're going to go ahead and give them a reason now to keep us housed in the Adjustment Center. So this was a coordinated and planned strike that was orchestrated against specific officers who were identified as being racist. And make no mistake about it, when the word racist is being used to describe officers that openly demonstrated racist behavior, it doesn't always mean white cops. They came in all different kinds of shades and colors. So Smokey was told to kick it off. He was told to slice one of the racist COs, and he did. He waited for the right opportunity to get a specific CO during feeding, and he kicked it off. So Smokey, I'm sure Smokey's plan was, 
was to wait for feeding. Because when they come on the tier and they feed, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, when they come on the tier, this is when they're the most vulnerable or when they're most open to, you know, this type of assault, whether they're going to get speared, sliced, gassed, or anything like that. So before they refitted the, the AC with solid doors and put solid walls up on front of the, at the front of the cells, the COs would come in on the tier and they'd hand you your breakfast, lunch, or dinner through a small tray slot on the doors. It was during this brief few minutes when they would be passing out the food that they would be exposed and compromised to these type of planned assaults. That's when they were most vulnerable, when they're on the tier, obviously, and when they pop that tray slot open. So when they go to hand you your food, that's when you get them. You either stab them, spear them, or you try to grab one of their arms, pull them through the tray slot, and slice them. So there was different ways that they were taking off on the seals in the AC when all this was happening. Either gassings, which is urine and feces that have been allowed to sit in the cup for two or three days until it ferments. Spearings or slashings. You know, spearings and slashings are obviously the worst and can result in serious injuries. And this is what they were doing. I remember hearing about all this when I was on the streets. I remember hearing, you know, a lot of this came out in the, in the newspapers, but I remember hearing that you know, the AC, the, the inmates in the, in the adjustment center were taking off on the COs that were working there. They were taking off on staff. And I knew exactly who it was before I even officially knew that it was the, the Mexican mafia. I knew that it was either the Crips and the Bloods or it was the Mexican mafia and the Sureños. And it was the Mexican mafia. So when Smokey's target finally came to his door to feed him, because he, he laid in the cuts and he waited for a specific CO to come to his door. And, you know, they, feeding is not the only time that they have an opportunity to get him. They come in and they do mail call. They come in and they do, you know, pill call with the nurse. There's other opportunities. But he waited for a specific time to get this specific CO. So when the CO comes to Smokey's door to pass him his lunch, Smokey reached through the tray slot, grabbed the CO's hand, and then he sliced him. Some of the other Sureños were told to keep this conflict going by gassing certain CO's, but it was the Mexican Mafia members who were initiating these assaults with weapons. And according to my source, this was one of the only times that he can remember where all the Carnaz got together and they all participated in this war against the administration. This was one of the only times that he could remember where everybody got involved and everybody participated. So Ronnie stepped up next. He also sliced the CO the same way Smokey did. Next, Chato fashioned a spear and speared another officer that was targeted. Chino from Modesto followed suit after Chato by spearing another CO. David from Fontana, he gassed the CO, and then Hector and Jose from Oakland, they both fought with COs during cell extractions. Every chance they got, they drew blood. They did. And because Little Fee and the Rolling 60s Cribs were being denied access to go back to East Block, that's when they got involved next. After Smokey sliced the first CO, he went to classification and then stomped another CO up. They were either trying to slip their cuffs or they just bull rush in the committee head first like a bull trying to take out whoever they could. The adjustment center was considered a war zone at that time. The COs that worked there, they didn't even want to go on the tiers unless they absolutely had to. That's how bad it got. In fact, it was because of this war that San Quentin paid a lot of money to, you know, to, to have people come in and refit all the cells with solid doors and solid walls in front of the cells. Like I told you guys, it used to be open with wire mesh, but that's why it all changed because of these wars right here. So while all this was going on, Ryder from the rolling 60s showed some solidarity and speared the next CO while he was locked in the shower. Then Roscoe, an SOS Samoan crib, who's always in the thick of shit, he speared another CO while he was in the law library. <laughs> This right here took some ingenuity because he not only had a limited amount of resources available, but he also had to fashion the spear in a short period of time. But all these incidents eventually led up to what was considered one of the biggest modern day threats to San Quentin's security since the escape attempt led and orchestrated by George Jackson in August of 1971. 
So while Little Fee and several other Rolling 60s Crips were out on the Adjustment Center's group recreation yards, Little Fee, Roscoe, and another Crip by the name of Noel Jackson cut through one of the chain link fences and attempted to take over the AC. So in the, in the Adjustment Center, when there used to be group yards before they brought in all these dog cages, the last guy that, that went out to the group yard, they would give him a wooden box. And inside that wooden box, there would be a, a you know, a set of, of hair clippers so that everybody out there on the yard could cut their hair. Well, I guess Fee, Roscoe, and this other crip, they used these hair clippers somehow to cut the links on one of the fences out there on the yard. I don't know how they did it because when, when you think about it, just thinking about how thick and sturdy those chain link fences are and you got a, a hair clipper to cut through that fence that takes a lot of patience and it obviously took a lot of a lot of power to be able to cut through a fence like that and it's time consuming how 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 were they able to cut that many links in the amount of time I mean, the yards, they only used to last for about two or three hours at the most. So they would have had to been working on a fence for a long time. I want to say that it was yard three that Fee and the other Rolling 60s Crips were on when they breached this fence. So in order for you guys to understand this, there's three yards out there. There's a yard that's all the way in the corner and it's kind of harder to see. That's probably the, the yard that it, that it happened on because, you know, when you're on that yard, you're kind of obstructed a little bit from the gun tower. You're way over in the corner and you would have a lot more time to work on a fence like that. But obviously they took these hair clippers, they cut a hole in the fence, and then they waited for yard recall, basically for the COs to come out and escort them back in the building. Now, the media... They documented this in the newspapers as an escape attempt, similar to the escape attempt that was orchestrated by George Jackson in August of 1971, the fatal escape attempt. Because, you know, if you've been to San Quentin, if you've been to the Adjustment Center and you know where the Adjustment Center is in relation to just the, the prison, it's like right in the middle of everything. So, Escaping from the AC it just doesn't seem practical. It just, it almost seems impossible. You would need a serious stroke of luck and just everything would have to, all the mountains and the stars and everything would have to be aligned perfectly in order for everything to go right. Because even if you were to get out of the AC, out of the adjustment center, even if you were to get out of that the, the front where George Jackson did before they cut him down. There's several gun towers out there by the chapel. Then you either got to go down towards the lower yard or you come, you make a right right there and you got to scale a wall that's probably like 40 or 50 feet high. So escape, it just doesn't seem practical. You know, that's what the media was saying. They were saying that these guys, these death row inmates were trying to escape. But in light of everything that was going on at that time, there was a war, you know, playing out in the Adjustment Center. It's obvious what Fee, Roscoe, and, you know, this other Rolling 60s crib were trying to do. So what they did was they waited until Yard Recall. And when it got close to Yard Recall, they crawled through the hole in the fence and they hid in an area that's it's kind of like a little walkway that leads to the three yards when you come out of the ac out of the building there's like a walkway and it leads you to all three yards this walkway is where the co's walk through so if you breach one of the fences and you get into that walkway when they come out the door you're going to have access to them i believe that's what they were trying to do they were waiting for that door to open and then they were going to rush them and give them the business you know but again just thinking about the tools that they use to cut the fence. It's just crazy. You know, metal definitely cuts metal. That much is understood, but it still doesn't seem like this would be an easy feat. Chain link fences are thick and the metal is sturdy. Just thinking about it would obviously not only take a lot of cutting to get through each link, 
but also a lot of power and patience. So they end up breaching the fence by using the hair clippers to cut through the metal links, and they basically hide in that small walkway that leads to the three yards. It's obvious that whatever their plan entailed, it included overpowering some of the COs and then doing whatever they were going to do. So when they anticipated that it was close to yard recall and for the COs to come out and escort them back into the building, that's when they climbed through the hole in the fence and hid in the walkway area that the COs had to use to come out and get them. So when the first of several COs opened up the building's yard door and seen Roscoe advancing and closing in on a short distance he had to make in order to get them, they doubled back and slammed the door shut. So apparently they were running towards that door when they opened up the door to come out for yard recall. And the COs, they opened the door up and they see Roscoe barreling in on him. Roscoe's a big dude. He's a big Samoan. So it's at that point that they turn around and they slam the door shut real fast. But at the same time, the gunner, he obviously sees that these guys are out of their yard and they're in that area. That's when he takes a 37 millimeter non-lethal gun and he starts shooting at Roscoe. According to my source and everything that I read in the newspapers, he hit Roscoe in the shoulder. The first shots or the first couple of shots that he, that he took at Roscoe, he hits Roscoe in the shoulders and he drops him. But Fee and this other crib, they jump over Roscoe and they continue to advance towards that door. The door's already locked, but you know, they're probably going to get to that door and they were probably going to try to pull it open, do whatever that they could to get inside where the COs were at. So I imagine when these COs, you know, when they when they when they double back, they went back in the building, they locked the door. That's when they started hitting the alarms. The alarms start going off. And, you know, according to my source that was there, there was about 70 officers that re responded to that incident. I mean, they took this very serious. These are death row inmates. They got nothing to lose. And, you know, Little Fee, Roscoe, and I don't know the other one, Noel Jackson, but I know Little Fee and Roscoe, they have a lot of history on death row. And, you know, they they know that these guys are not, you know, cats to play with. So by then, they got all these alarms going off. And, you know, you guys got to understand, they were taking this very serious. These are death row inmates. They got nothing to lose, especially Fee, Little Fee and Roscoe. These are, you know, these both of these guys have a lot of history in San Quentin. They both have done some shit since they've been there on death row. And, you know, they're just both well-known individuals. Like 70 COs respond all hands on deck. They got everybody responding from everywhere. Not only do a bunch of COs respond from other units, other surrounding units, but they also had like 10 or 15 gunners. They saturated the gun walks all around the, the AC yards. So, you know, this incident, it, it took a while to play out. I imagine that once all these COs started responding, you know, they're telling Fee, <clears throat> Roscoe, and this other guy to get back in the yard. They were probably, you know, in a standoff at some point. And then you had all these gunners that started you know, popping up on, on, on the gun walks. So now they got all these guns on them. And eventually they realized that, you know, they can't get out of where they're at. It's not going to go any further. You know, what are they going to do? They're, they're trapped in that little area. But according to everything that, you know, my source told me and everything that was in the media, this is when they told Fee, Roscoe, and this other guy to climb back through the hole in the fence and lay on the ground back on the yard. They wanted to get them back in an area, you know, where they, they were contained and where they, they would have better, you know, access at, at cuffing them up and pulling them off the yard. Basically, they were scared. They were scared to walk out there and to handcuff them. I believe that they knew that if they were to open that door and walk out there and try to handcuff them, these cats would have jumped up, regardless of the fact that they had all these guns on them. You know, this show of force is indicative of how serious of a threat that they took this. These are death row inmates who have lengthy histories that involve several acts of violence, guys that don't hesitate when it comes to spilling blood. So, you know, they weren't taking no chances. So after they finally got control of the situation and put little Fee, Roscoe, and Noel back in their cells, the violence in the adjustment center, it continued. 
this was just one of several incidents that played out over you know the course of time when all this was happening. So they put little Fee, Roscoe, and this other guy back in their cells. And you know, in the meantime, the Mexican mafia, they're still at war with the administration. They're still taking off on, on COs that work in the adjustment center. So a week after this incident, Roscoe and a few other Crips decided to kick it off again. They decided to board up during a time when they were conducting cell searches in the AC. Now, during this time that all this happened, they were locked down. They slammed them down after that incident where they tried to, you know, where they breached that, that, that fence on the yard. So they slammed them down and they had all kinds of people out there putting up some new fences, probably some thick ass fences, or that's when... That matter of fact, that's when they came in, they took down all the fences, and then they started putting in the dog cages. That's when the group yards went away after that incident right there. That's, you know, I forgot about that, but that's when they brought in all those cages. So when all this was going on, there's no yard. The COs are, are doing random searches inside of, of the adjustment center, that's when Roscoe and some of the other Crips decide, you know what, let's fucking board up and let's kick it off again. So that's what they do. And for those of you that don't know what boarding up is, boarding up is when you basically tie something up in front of your cell, a sheet, a blanket, or you, know, you put something on your bars to where you're obstructing them from looking in your cell they are required to physically see you in your cell when they come by to do count or when they come by to do welfare checks. That's a requirement. They have to see a body in the cell. And if they can't see you, they got to come in there and do a cell extraction or get you out of the cell one way or the other. So that's what Roscoe and these other cribs did. They boarded up and they're like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's kick it off. Let's, let's kick off some, some cell extractions. So that's what they did. So when Roscoe, and some of these other Crips, when they were getting cell extracted, this is when Ronnie, Hector, Chato, Smokey, some of the other Mexican Mafia members that were housed in AC, that's when they were like, you know what? Let's show some solidarity. Let's fucking ride with these dudes and let's, let's cell extract. And that's what they did. The AC, from what I was told, the AC was turned into a war zone. It was already a war zone, but that night, I mean, it lasted all night. They were doing cell extractions from cell to cell. Everybody got involved. They were going down the line on each tier, hitting these cells. And, you know, guys were in there fighting. They were going at it. So it turned into a war zone. And the adjustment center, from that point on, it turned into a harsh environment, you know, to be. A lot of guys, not just Sureños, but, you know, a lot of the white guys over there, some of the Africanos, they all checked in just to get out of the adjustment center because it was such a fucked up place to be. That's when they came in with all the dog cages. They came in with all the, the, the solid doors, the solid walls, and the adjustment center changed into something that was just a fucked up place to be. They shut everything down. You can't have shit over there now. When they come in to feed, they literally come in. One, one cop has got a, a pepper ball gun that he points at you at your tray slot while the other one stands there and feeds you. They're not taking no chances. And they also come in with shields. Every time they come on the tier, they come in with full body gear, helmets, and helmets, vests, and shields. So this incident right here started with the fist fight between DMAC and Carlos. That's how everything started. That led to everything else. But looking back at those days and remembering the wars, the acts of solidarity and all the unity that was shown, one has to wonder now if it was all for nothing. To go through all those sacrifices and to go through everything that they all did only to walk the yards with some of the dudes that they're being forced to program with now. And all the so-called codes, the principles, the standards, what does it even represent? But anyways, my source that gave me this story, he told me, he's like, you know what, Box? It seems like for every step forward that we took, we ended up taking three steps back. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story right here. I wanted to get it out to you guys before I get into these other stories I got. I got some, some fire for you guys, trust me. I posted something in the community letting you guys know why we hadn't been posting for the last couple of days. Things come up, you know, beyond YouTube. 
sometimes things outside of YouTube distract us and, you know, we got to take care of life on this side as well. But anyways, we're back on track. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. And I'll try to get an inner demons out tonight. You guys enjoy your day. I hope you're having a productive day. With that being said, this is your boy B and I'm out. <laughs>